Welcome back to Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel here in Honolulu, ThinkTech. And we are talking with uh, an old friend of ThinkTech, Gary Kondekar, and she is in Brussels. And it's 12 hours difference, but she stayed up late for us. Hi, Gary, so nice to see you. Hi, Jay, lovely to see you again and lovely to be back on ThinkTech, thanks. <laughs> Just in the way of background, Gary was uh, a fellow at Pacific Forum here in, eight years ago. And she was on our show at the time. And uh, it was on the very day she was leaving back for Europe, uh, where she has been since. Uh, well, with various trips to various places. She's a, um, a, a global relations expert person uh, and into climate change these days. She has been with a number of think tanks and now she's with the University of, did I say right, Brussels? Brussels, yeah, Brussels Free University. Okay, and uh, and uh, uh, although she does not speak Flemish, uh, we're going to conduct this entire conversation in Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, Gary, um, in, in a word, how how have you been? You know, catch up with our with our viewers and uh, try try to bring them current over the last few years. Oh, there's been so much happening. I've been shifting from a lot from foreign policy to climate change. And I think I, I, I made the big shift at the right time. Uh, there's been these uh, street protests. I've, everybody's heard of Greta Thunberg, but there have been uh, so many manifestations in, uh, in Brussels uh, all the time, the uh, youth climate for movements, etc. So I've been working a lot on climate change. I work on um, how the Paris Agreement can be better implemented. And I also work on how we can decarbonize industry. Uh, so like the steel industry, the chemical uh, refining industry. <laughs> so a lot of the geeky stuff. So this well, is sounds wonderful, the especially these days. You know, so the US was uh, was part of the, uh, the COP21, as I remember, but now, under Trump, we turn our back on climate change. Uh, we, we turn our back on, um, you know, environment in general. And every day, uh, although he sets an agenda in front of the White House, it's very distracting. The fact is his administration has been running 180 uh, from, you know, anybody into climate change or environment. So I'm, I'm just wondering how the community in Europe because uh, I'm sure you you touch base with them all around Europe. How how the community in Europe feels about what's happened to the United States' position on climate change and the environment? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's um, it's quite sad because the U.S. Uh, um, should be one of the biggest players because they're also one of the biggest emitters, and the world needs the U.S. to be on board. Uh, so it's been quite sad that Donald Trump has pulled uh, the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement and um, what, what we have been doing since, so the shock factor has since left. Uh, what the Europeans thought at the time was that maybe it would lead to other countries leaving the Paris Agreement, but that didn't happen. Mm. There, was, um, there were many countries, for example, India and China in particular, who reinforced their commitments to the Paris Agreement. So that was good on the uh, one hand. And on the other hand, um, what we did was started to analyze what, what's happening in the US. So there are various states, um, uh, there are um, uh, even cities uh, uh, which are uh, leading in climate action. So for, we, we look a lot at California uh, and they've been doing great action there. Um, but also the number of uh, corporations that are leading uh, in their own pledges for climate action. Uh, just today, we were looking at some uh, decarbonization technology from Hawaii. So um, we look at it at also uh, more at a piecemeal scale, yeah, and hope the U.S. will be back again. Well, the U.S., yeah, the U.S. needs to have a, a change in leadership. I think it's clear. Um, I, I was telling you before the um, from the show that there was an article in the the Irish Times by an Irish um, um, political writer yesterday uh, or day before, yeah. and, 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 he, and he said, well, you know, there, there were times when Europe uh, and the world in general held the United States in awe, 
uh, that they were they admired the United States, uh, all these positive kinds of impressions of the United States as a world leader. But now it's not that at all. Now, he said they hold they hold pity for the United States. And I, I read this article. I said, my God, you know that he's absolutely right. If you look in the looking glass, that what how what else can you feel about it? <clears throat> Which takes me to coronavirus, because we have it, you have it. It's a pandemic, <clears throat> and I wonder what the sense of the you know people in Europe is about how well this administration and the United States uh, has responded to coronavirus um, as it exists here in the United States. So um, for us here in Europe, it's quite shocking the way the US has been handling the crisis. Um, it's uh, the first thing was that um, it, we thought that it would be a moment for Donald Trump to actually take um, it was it was it was clearly his make or break moment uh, for re-election at least, um, and unfortunately he didn't take the bull by the horns. Let's say it was his opportunity to reinforce to people that he could uh, be there for them. Um, but since then, um, uh, Donald Trump has called it a hoax. Um, it was it's been largely mismanaged and. Uh, the amount of infections that uh, are there in the U.S. at the moment, I think it's already a million. It's huge. It's it's quite sad, actually, when um, when the U.S. has traditionally had a sort of foresight, uh, and we did read a bit in the newspapers that uh, every administration does these exercises before of uh, imagining pandemics and how to handle them, and this was not conducted in a similar way. But also in how uh, aid is being uh, delivered by um, the center to the various states, uh, and only uh, Republican-friendly states have been getting um, more aid, and the others have to really grovel for it. Uh, it's quite shocking, to be honest, and and also the fact that they have to pay for the treatment because in Europe, uh, none of the um, uh, the people who get coronavirus have to pay any. Uh, any medical fees, even for the tests. Um, so it's been quite shocking. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, when maybe when things cool off, I'll come to Europe. I, I'll feel safer there. Uh, Definitely. <laughs> so how, how are things doing in Europe on coronavirus? How are things doing in Belgium, uh, you know, in the countries around Belgium? Do you feel the, that the response there is uh, is acceptable? Do you feel that we're going to be out of the woods on this? Uh, so, um, of course, for us, the U.S. has been the extreme on the bad side of dealing with coronavirus. But here in Europe, we also have different examples. Uh, and we do <laughs> complain about uh, our own countries as well and how they respond to it and how even the minutest action. So let me just explain a bit what's, ha what's been happening in Belgium. So we have a nationwide yeah. lockdown. Schools were closed already in uh, mid-March. And since then, um, we were all encouraged to work, uh, not encouraged, we were mandated to stay at home, work online. Uh, and there were only some uh, essential workers, so for example, supermarkets or, or hospitals, uh, uh, pharmacists who could go to work. And now they've been trying to uh, relax the measures. So until then, we also had, for example, the ability to uh, go out and uh, um, exercise, uh, like a walk in the park, for example, or a jog. Uh, some people yeah. did try to abuse it a bit, but then there have been police all around and there have been uh, thousands of fines, each around uh, $300 for, per oh, incident no, wow. and per Yes, so it's been quite strict, but it's not even been as strict as in other countries. So, for example, Italy or Spain, where uh, they have to have um, permits to go out of their home, uh, to go shop for food uh, or medicines. Um, so they literally have to fill out a, a, a print out a, a form. Um, and many Italians living in Belgium were complaining that you know we it's like seeing uh, the the future because we know what Italy has been through and this is what we need to go we are going to go through. 
but the measures are not yet in place. They're not strict enough. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so it's been that. And it's so Belgium's response has been, you know, uh, let's say 75% strict. Uh, Germany has been similar. In the U UK, the, um, the response has been a bit similar to the US. So Boris Johnson, uh, the prime minister of the UK, shocked everyone when he said, we would like to create herd immunities. Uh, let as many people as possible get the coronavirus and then people will <laughs> survive eventually. What? what? <laughs> yes. Yes. It was really shocking until he himself got it. And then uh, he was in hospital. He was in intensive care. And now he's uh, really put the UK under lockdown. Um, but, but this has led to around 40,000 deaths in the US, UK. It's not far uh, behind the US, actually. So, and no, the same but, uh, thing in know, the, the population is by is per capita, it would be a, ahead of the US, I think, at 40,000. No, yes, yes, yes. And yeah. Belgium with uh, around 7,000 dead is still ahead of the UK by population size. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in other countries, also like Sweden, for instance, they've had no measures, no lockdowns, but now they're trying to ease the the lockdown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how how about you? How has it affected you? I guess you're working at home. Are you washing your hands? Mm -hmm. Are you taking short walks in the park? How, you haven't been fined, I guess. No, I've not been fined. So I <laughs> I normally, it, to be honest, it is quite hard psychologically because there's this huge pandemic the whole world's changed overnight and psychologically it does impact you and many people are not understanding or acknowledging that so i think that's important to do so what uh what do i do is uh, basically try to keep uh, this sim a similar schedule with at least the dog walks i have a dog and i go walk him in the park a few times a day but then yes i've been working from home mainly um the good thing is our university, so I work at the university, right? And we had been making the shift to online teaching, etc. So we did have, we were quite advanced anyways um, at uh, e-learning. So making the shift to working from home has not been a big issue for at least me. <laughs> ah, that's good. Are you using Zoom or something else? Yes, Zoom, Skype for business, uh, Microsoft Teams. <laughs> but yes, by the way, yeah, I do go great. out and wash my hands a lot, and I do wear a mask as well. <laughs> Got a few masks around, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's relaxed. No fines yet, thankfully. I hope no more. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Well, it's very interesting. It sounds so similar to uh, you know my life here and um, the lives of the people that I deal with uh, in think tech. But let me let me uh, let me go to a question that uh, that we've been working on, and that maybe you mm -hmm. thought about too. <clears throat> so you have two big things happening, two existential threats these days. One, of course, is climate change. Lest we forget, you know, Donald Trump sucks up all the oxygen, but in fact, you know, we have forest fires, we have floods, we have all these yeah. indicia of dreadful climate change and including storms that will probably come in a few months that will affect everybody you know and and, and i worry about affecting hawaii um so that that's one existential threat and the other is uh, the pandemic for which there is no therapeutic drug no matter what he says um and there is no vaccine and there may not be one for a long time and we we may develop the you know herd uh, a herd immunity, whether we like it or not, because so many people ultimately yeah. are low hanging fruit and the virus will get yeah. to them. Okay, so what I'd like to explore with you, if you've had any thoughts about this, is the relationship between the two. We know, for example, that coronavirus has effectively stopped a lot of economic activity. And when you look at the world right. map to see how much energy is being used, you see a lot less energy has been used a lot less oil, the oil market collapsed. Um, and yeah. so, uh, you know, th there's a relationship there. The other relationship I find um, even more interesting in the sense that um, climate change by perhaps raising temperature 
climate change by changing. We don't even know all the flora and fauna that it has changed in the world, that it is changing, may have contributed to the development of the virus. And, and so there's a two-way street on that. Each one somehow affects the other. What do you think about that? That's my proposition for you. What do you think about that? Yeah, there's a clear link. In Europe, at least, everybody has been trying to, uh, the research community has been making the link between coronavirus and, and climate change quite strongly, but in particular in terms of recovery. So you know this will lead to another uh, financial crisis maybe, uh, uh, and uh, it's going to be uh, quite devastating for most parts of the world, but especially the West. Uh, like the last crisis, Asia escaped, but this time, uh, again, it, it might be the case uh, that Asia comes out a bit less impacted than the West. So what we've been doing in Europe is uh, the research community has tried to uh, see how do we get out of this, but also maintain our response to uh, climate change. So right before the coronavirus pandemic struck, what, uh, there were really interesting developments here in Brussels, and I think you must have spoken about it too, is the Green New Deal. And the Green New Deal is a mega um, financial program to transform uh, the economy into a green economy, basically, uh, so that uh, Europe will become carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, and uh, uh, the amount envisaged for this would be between 1 trillion and 4 trillion, something like that. And um, so now what uh, the thinking here has been that uh, the Green Deal needs to be reinforced as a way to get out of the coronavirus uh, uh, impact on the economy. And also the companies that will get bailout uh, should have to uh, use that money to uh, make uh, sustainable changes to their production, their processes, their machines, et cetera, so that they come out less uh, polluting and more in line with uh, the climate ambitions. So this is quite interesting, no? Yeah. Oh, so is that actually happening or is that aspirational? That is uh, that is where the thinking is going at the moment. We, I, um, I think the, the policymakers will just need to announce it. Uh, but it, it makes sense, you know. Um, anyways, the, uh, the, let's say industry, for instance, yeah, because we now see the chemical industry, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the textile industry, then they've been really useful in making the medicines, the masks, the cleaning products, etc. not to drink <laughs> or inject, but, um, they've been <laughs> <Thank> really, <you. laughs> they've been really, uh, at the center of it and they've been strategic, right? Uh, these industries have for many years in Europe been making a lot of progress uh, in order to reduce their emissions. So now um, they will suffer eventually because of the financial crisis that will come. But then this money from the Green Deal could help them to become greener, but also more resilient. So this is the thinking yeah, that's well, going on. Yeah, well, that's very good. You know. One of the things that, it, you know, necessarily we all have to cover going forward is how is coronavirus and for that matter, the, the threat of climate change, how are these existential threats changing our world? Um, you know, in some countries, uh, some places, uh, they're going to change our world more and some less. Uh, the smart guys change. You know, survival is change. Um, the other guys, maybe uh, in, in this country, uh, they, they don't change so well. They want to go back to another time. But uh, what I wanted to ask you, if you've been thinking, you know, in your, your think tank kind of way, Gowry, um, you know, how at least Europe is going to change by reason of the combination of things. You, you, you've mentioned that um, people are going to try to, you know, policymakers are going to try to do, do things yeah. about the green revolution, do things about, uh, you know, climate change and sustainability ability and try to get the economy going and also deal with the response. But my question to you is, um, how do you see it evolving? What is it going to be like in the next few years? Say, say a five-year horizon. Uh, it's going to be different. For example, civil liberties may be affected. If, if you go you know, out in the street and you're caught in the street and they give you $300 fine, then it somehow impinges on the civil liberty notion that you may have had before. 
Um, and, and there's all, all kinds of other things in other countries, not in Western Europe so much, um, where, you know, where the government is, is leaning on this, uh, as Trump is trying to do, as Xi Jinping is certainly doing. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you have a question of the, the change in the relationship of the citizen and the government, the change in the way yeah. the government works, the change in our personal yeah. freedoms. Um, do you have a sense of how it's evolving and what it's going to be like, say, in Europe in the next five years? Yeah, I mean, there's been so many changes already just because of one pandemic, right? I mean, uh, flying, for instance, will be forever changed, uh, traveling um, <clears throat> in the short and the long term. Uh, now we've been thinking about not having the middle row in, uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the airplanes. So how would that affect traveling? Will a lot of people travel or not? Uh, and, and, and just um, going out, interacting, uh, even as much as having lunch or dinner with friends. So it's um, going to a restaurant and that's the essence of life in Europe, you know, all the bistros, the restaurants, uh, and that's really going to be impacted at the very basic level. Um, going forward, uh, we don't know the big impacts of climate change that may or may not come, you know, is something drastic could happen just as um, we didn't see foresee the coronavirus crisis. So for instance, um, with the melting, uh, melting of the, the poles, there, there could be other viruses. Uh, and this is quite, a, there are scientists have written about this um, that have been frozen for ages that could come about again and we don't have any uh, anti antibiotics for them. Um, so we are at a large risk um, when large swathes of land will go underwater um, <clears throat> in Bangladesh, for instance, uh, in India, but, but also in a lot of uh, European countries, uh, when we start losing land uh, and the migration crisis becomes um, worse, uh, especially in Africa, when there will be less and less uh, water um, and that anyways has a link to different crisis. So it's going to be exacerbated, but life as we know it <laughs> has, uh, has been changed uh, from now on, I, I think, and it's, um, it's going to change quite, uh, quite more uh, in the coming years. And yeah. whatever Europe does or doesn't do, it, it can't impact the whole world alone. So um, um, a, a global question for you, can, can the planet, with all these things in mind, can the planet support the existing population? Uh, you know, do, I don't know if you remember, there was a movie called Human Flow a few years ago, done by Ai Weiwei, the Chinese dissident. And in it, he, uh, he showed us that uh, there were 65 million people behind barbed wire in various camps around the world, and they would never leave those camps. There was no political solution for them. They would live and die, and their children would live and die in these camps. Um, and you know, that sort of suggests that maybe, maybe it's it's not working for an awful lot of people, and and that may increase. And so, uh, you know, I ask you in terms of agriculture, in terms of water, in terms of clean air, and in terms of um, you know the, the the resources you need to live uh, going forward. Do you think the planet can survive with this many people? Um, and if you do think the planet can survive, can you tip us off on what it must do to survive? <laughs> So, um, I, I, yesterday, actually, uh, I saw a video from uh, a speech of Nicolas Sarkozy, the former president of France, and he was mentioning that uh, he's around uh, 65 years old, and when he was born, basically, the global population was uh, 2 billion, and in his lifetime, it increased threefold, and he said in the next 30 years, it's going to become 11 billion. And that's quite something to think about. And our planet can definitely not sustain so much uh, population. <clears throat> but it's um, there's a need to look at it in a um, in a really a global community way, kind of how uh, looking at it as one planet and not country by country um, <clears throat> on what impact population will have. And you're right. I I honestly don't think we can. <laughs> survive uh comfortably 
with uh, 11 billion people and the economic disparity. Because anyway, as the coronavirus makes it clear, those who can afford it will survive. Those who can't, don't. Um, and it's quite sad. I mean, because of the social security um, systems here in Europe, uh, it's less exacerbated the, the economic divide. But uh, but globally, it's quite true. Those who really can afford to live will live. So uh, with the rising population, it's going to be just that, unfortunately. So unless we control uh, population rise, um, it will be quite grim along with uh, uh, the heat, uh, the, uh, the climate change. Yeah. Uh, one other one other question I wanted to get your advice on is um, so so the, the issue exists perhaps in a more clarified way in Europe than in the U.S. But you have to take you you have to take steps um to protect the public health and you also have to take steps ultimately to revive the economy to as you mm. as you want to take off the lockdown and i wonder if you have any thoughts about how you solve that problem it's complex multi parts and how is your approaching that i mean my own view is first you have to do testing first you have to flatten the curve that's first you don't you don't uh, undo the lockdown until you you're very sure you've got that worked out for your entire jurisdiction not just parts of it but all of it uh, and only then do you make a systematic approach to recovering the economy but what, what would you add to that i completely agree with you jay i'm so 100 percent behind you on this uh, and i sometimes feel that we're starting to recover the economy too quickly you know, lifting the lockdowns is too soon. Uh, and it's not only because of, um, uh, um, because, you know, younger people are healthier, whatever it's, uh, they're going to be significant losses. Uh, and, and it's not that also, it's not that if you get the coronavirus once you have immunity, that's not the case. Um, people are getting it multiple times even. Uh, and even yes. though Trump might be a fool enough to say it, but, um, Every other country is also thinking in terms of acceptable losses uh, in terms of population. Uh, and that's quite sad, I feel, what they're doing here. So there are different approaches that different countries are using. So in France, um, rightfully, uh, and Macron is quite a good leader. So he's doing, just as you said, he's going to um, uh, back uh, testing, testing of the population uh, a lot, um, really. Um, uh, in Belgium, what we're doing is we're going to relax the measure. So from next week, um, schools will start, shops will open. And I think that's really too soon um, to do that. Uh, but then uh, the prime minister here said that uh, these measures are not cast in stone, you know, so they could be reversed. Um, in, in other countries as well, they're trying to open up the economy. But honestly, I think uh, it's going to be... Uh, quite a threat um, to, to a large amount of the population, uh, especially if schools open because children can carry, there have been some deaths among children as well, uh, but they, they certainly are carriers. Uh, it's gonna spread to yeah. uh, very quickly amongst the population. And we don't have measures like other countries in China, for instance, there's a shortage of masks. We can't, uh, it's really hard to find masks around here even in Europe. Uh, uh, uh. So even though well, we're not, uh, in uh, Belgium, yeah, sorry, even tests, though in Belgium, it's, tests, is it? Yeah. Yeah. it is, it's not a uh, testing of the global population, not done in Belgium yet, but they did mandate that afterwards, everybody will have to wear masks and go to work. But like I said, there's no masks uh, easily available here. I, I know how somebody's going to make a lot of money making masks. <laughs> well, Gary, you know, there's so much, there's so much happening, you know, at the same time, I feel that uh, although the last time I saw you in person, um, in, on the streets of Honolulu, eight years ago, you reminded me, um, it's like, it's like you never left. And uh, what I really want to yeah. do is follow this global adventure we're having now. It's probably more of an adventure than we ever could have imagined eight years ago. 
And, and I hope I can catch you again in Brussels. It, you don't have to stay up too late. Right now, it must be, oh, gee whiz, 10 o'clock at night already. Perfect. Perfect <laughs> but can we, can, can we do this again? Can we do this again? There's much more to discuss. Yes, yes I'd love <laughs> that right. too. OK, the same here, Gary. Gary Kondekar, our, our friend at ThinkTech for many years, and we look forward to catching up with her on a regular basis. We look forward to making the comparison, the global comparison, if you will, which is so important these days. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Steve. Thanks.